he sent me, I mean, he's mapping on the sword, like tapping me on the sword. He said, well, Shano, how old did he ride this train before it runs off the tracks? And the belief was in two, three shows, this be belly up and that'll be it, right? <laughs> We're going to talk about Terry Funk. I mean, this really is the big news. Yeah. And uh, and um, I, I want to mention this as well, that Terry Funk's passing sort of coincided with an even more shocking death in wrestling with Bray Wyatt, Wyndham Rotunda. So yes. Terry Funk's passing sort of just got pushed into the background a little bit. Um WWE did a great tribute to both Bray and Terry on the same SmackDown. I think people were assuming that maybe you get like a graphic or, you know, a couple of minutes of a video at the beginning. But no, they, they really wrapped the whole show around both he and Bray pretty, even Keel, mm. which I thought was a great um, a tribute. Anyway, sure. let me uh, read a tiny bit for you. Is the death of Terry Funk, August 23rd of 2023, former NWA world champion, a member of pretty much every wrestling hall of fame in existence, including WWE Pro Wrestling, The Observer, NWA St. Louis, and even the short-lived WCW Hall of Fame. Terry was a legend in the Territory Days, a legend in all major promotions in the US and Japan, and he was the giant whose shoulders ECW was built upon. Uh, his health went south around 2016 when he had surgery to fix an inguinal hernia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And then yep. attended Tommy Dreamer's House of Hardcore shows way before he was ready to. Now, subsequent surgeries didn't help, and then dementia kicked in. And then his wife passed away uh, in 2018, and then his health really started suffering after that. And uh, he ended up passing away at the age of 79. Now, I know you were uh, pretty close to him over a course of many decades, quite frankly. Um before we talk more about Terry, I'm going to give you a quote that Terry has said over the years. Every match is a great match until it begins. <laughs> Sounds exactly like Terry, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, when I'm sitting and listening to you read the, the, you know, that intro there. And uh, in my head, I'm like a, like a real playing. I'm seeing Terry the first day we get picked up for ECW at the airport. Um, uh, he always called me Shano. And, uh, we were in the in the hotel van. He's in the last row, and I'm like, I don't, I think there, don't think there was anybody else in the van. And he sit behind me, smacking on the sword, like tapping me on the sword. He said, "Well, Shano, how old did he ride this train before it runs off the tracks?" And the belief was, in two, three shows, this be belly up, and that'll be it, right? Um, but every match that, that comment by Terry, every match that I was ever in with him, uh, he he was incredible, honestly. Uh, you know, he, the first time, the first match that I had with him in ECW televised, uh, not the first match, but the first televised match was the 45 minute Broadway. Now I'd never done a, a Broadway, uh, that long before. And Terry walked into the building that day and was really hobbled. Like he did look like he could barely stand up. And I went to Paul and I thought like, I'm not even sure I can get through a 45 minute Broadway, let alone with a guy that really can't stand up. You know, like I'm now I'm getting nervous, you know, and, uh, but he's Terry Funk and, and we talked and, you know, we went to the ring and I literally fought for my life. I mean, it was like being in the ring with a tiger, you know, you just, and, and what, what I recall most specifically about that match was, uh, the chaining sequences, uh, you know, the, on the mat chaining sequences, uh, and I'm, I'm to this day, even more amazed at it. You know, I'm a little bit older now than Terry was when he, when he first helped us start ECW. When you go back and you watch those matches of Terry and realize his age and the level that he was performing at, at that age in that incredibly physical style is mind blowing to me. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm about 50% <laughs> used to be able to do. And, uh, just another one of those things that like, people always say, like, I, I always maintain that the words legend and icon and, you know, that type of, it gets thrown around way too loosely in this kind of country, every, you know, in, the, in this industry, everybody's an, an icon. Everybody's a legend to me. Legends are Bruno, Harley, Terry, you know, like, <laughs> you gotta look up pretty high to see where those guys are or faces are on the mountaintop. Uh, because they were amazing at what they did in the ring, uh, Terry, and, and in that match, the forty-five minute Broadway, um, which was the month before the uh, three-way dance sixty-minute match, uh, my shoulder dislocates. Uh, you know, we're on the mat chaining, and I go to reverse on it. Oh, oh, oh! He knew it instant, instinctively. He said, Hold on! He rolled over. Had you know, had, had already had a grip of my wrist. Rolled over, put his foot in my side, popped it right back in. 
Like it was just, Hey, your laces are untied. Let me tie it for you. You know, it was, uh, and you know, for anybody that's out there that's in the business, you'll know what I'm talking about when you get hurt in the ring in that moment, zero pain is just go on with it. Right. The second you get back to the dressing room, the pain goes, you know, they say a scale of one to 10, it goes to 35 choo, straight through and, uh, Sherry Martell, rest her soul. Uh, great, great lady. Um, she came up to me. She had a beer in her hand. She goes, open, open, uh, open my mouth. She threw something in my mouth and she poured the beer. And I, so I didn't, I, I'm thinking it was like a Percocet or something. I like got, you know, a, a, a smaller, uh, uh, and, you know, it felt like a capsule. What, what was that? And she didn't say, she said, keep pouring the beer. Two or three minutes later, I go to say something. And I went, <laughs> like my mouth. <laughs> and she said, she'd give me a Placidil, you know, one of the Elvis Presley things. I, I made myself vomit it up, but that, that match with Terry, uh, was the prelude to that, but he, uh, was incredibly physical in the ring. Uh, and no matter how hard you would push, he would stay there with it. Now he'd get back to that dressing room and be, just be zonked out. Right. But it, again, I challenge anybody to go back and watch those matches. Uh, uh, you know, he's in the ring with some young bucks, right? We were some young lions, and man, he has given up nothing. Like it's not, he's not lost a step on any of it. And if you do see some place where it looks like maybe he's a half a step behind or whatever, realize that he's no matter which match he's in, he's the captain of that ship. I'd recently watched the, uh, the three way ladder match with, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sandman and, Sam and, yeah. and Stevie Richards. Yes. And, uh, you know, same thing. I know the match with me and Sabu, the three way. Uh, Sabu and I, not, not have ever been in a three way. I'd never even seen a three way. So, uh, we were all playing off of Terry and it felt the same thing. Like Herky in the moment of the match, it never felt like it hit a groove. It's you know, when you have those great matches, uh, and that is considered one of those today. In my memory, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that because when you have those great matches, it just reaches a point where it's, it's work, it's work, it's work. And then all of a sudden it goes on autopilot. It's just like, and you get to the dressing room, you're like trying to recall the match in your head. And it's just sort of a blur. Like they just, we did 60 minutes out there. Uh, it, it, it's strange to you. And, and that was because Terry Funk was in the ring and an incredible talent like Sabu and me were both playing off of Terry Funk. Uh, just an amazing, amazing performer. That was a, an incredible boon to the industry from the time he got into the time he got out. Uh, Rick Flair said that Terry simply doesn't get his due because his wrestling prime was too early for cable television. I suppose he's right there, really, because he was NWA yeah. champion in 1975. So what was that? That was 10 years after he debuted. So I think he debuted in 65. Wow. So um, let me just have a look here. So he actually lost. Sorry, uh, he won the NWA world title two and a half years after Dory had lost it to Harley Race. Uh, how did Terry keep the fans interested as far as making it look like he was close to losing the belt? I know you weren't there in the NWA days, but like the kind of like master that Terry was, how would he have gone to all these different places and let people know that there's always a chance I could lose it tonight? That was the magic of Terry Funk. Um, uh, first of all, just in, in, in concert with what you just said about his career starting, I agree with Ray. It's a great comment. Um, you know, television was, you know, in the 60s, but still in its infancy. And, you know, re re by the way, a little footnote for the wrestling fans out there. The first nationally broadcast uh, entity in the United States on television was wrestling from from one of the, I forget, not Kabisky Park, one of the parks in uh, like Palisade or Par Paradise uh, Park, something like that in Chicago. Uh, it was the first on Dumont. The first new network was Dumont Network. So, yeah, I mean, television was there. But it was, you know, it was still creating itself. Yeah, you know, but like, by the fifties, by the fifties, wrestling on national TV was pretty much gone. And I don't know when all these UHF stations came up, and then it just became right. a regional thing again until cable uh, yeah. became prominent. Th throughout the entirety of my childhood, like growing up watching wrestling, it was the the territories you know you'd get we we occasionally would get Georgia Championship wrestling, uh, but it wasn't until cable came in. We got the NWA, which would later be WCW, and the national WWWF show. Uh, up to that time, it would be the local studio wrestling show, which is what they would do. Uh, I had just recently, and, and this is what's in concert with what you had mentioned there, a, a couple days ago, saw some pictures of Terry uh, when he and Vicky were married. 
And I literally had to stare at the picture for a while. I'm thinking like, that's not blonde hair, and, you know, a lot thinner build and everything. I'm looking, looking, and you start looking because again, they were both incredibly young. Um, and and Vicky was a looker, man. She was a beautiful woman. Uh, yeah, but then when you like you zoom in on it and like, look at the picture, you go, okay, you can see in the eyes it, it was Terry. Um, but I think the magic, like, and what you're saying, like, no matter where he was and whatever generation it was, uh, pre television, the television era of professional wrestling in the hyper years of the 80s and early 90s, uh, much like I just told my son yesterday, uh, the musician in uh, Dando Veins, um, the key, I think, in, in entertainment, whether it's music or it's uh, uh, wrestling or, or some other uh, entity, is to have uh, got all these chords down here, um, is to stay relevant to the time, right? Like if, if you're playing, like uh, everybody's a huge Kiss fan, uh, you can see through Kiss's trajectory, the first three songs, uh, albums sound very poorly produced, like mm. tinny sounding. Yeah. Then they come out with uh, uh, Live, and then the next uh, Destroyer by Bob Ezrin that had this over-the-top grandiose sound, right, that just really took them into a different stratosphere. But then beyond that, like as they moved into the 80s and into the 90s, they would transcend and like sort of bend a little bit to the to the prevailing winds. Terry did that. Uh, if you go back and you watch Terry Funk as champion in the NWA back in, what, the 70s, uh, if you look at the start of his career, and each one of those things, Terry fits perfectly into that generation. Uh, it's, it's seamless. Uh, you don't, when you're watching Terry Funk in the nineties in ECW, you don't look and go, Oh, this guy's a relic from the past. You know, he's something else. He was completely relevant in ECW. The night that he won the belt at 53 years old, the emotion in that building was palpable. Uh, you know, his tears were, were palpable. first of all, he's a great actor. Uh, but secondly, you know, his, his tears were real because Terry knew what this meant, right? Like, we understand the industry, the, the work of it and everything, but the, uh, a rising promotion like ECW to put the belt on somebody that age, especially in that style, uh, there was never a time the fans went, oh, come on, it should be Sabu or it should be Taz or some or Sam Man. Um, you know, they, they it was a love fest for Terry Funk and an outpouring of respect that was very well-deserved. Uh uh, in, in my recollection, I don't think I ever saw Terry, ECW or before, ever go to the ring and half ass it. Um, you know, and, and that may sound trite, like every, fans may be thinking, well, everybody does that. No, everybody doesn't do that. There's a lot of times guys will go, hey, the building's only half full. Let's take it easy tonight. Uh, or you'd come back after really working hard and they'd say, hey, thanks, Shane. I got to go out and work harder, right? Well, yeah, that's, isn't that the point of it? Terry Funk never did that. And, uh, uh, boy, what a what a blessing it was for me at that stage of my career to get put in the ring with a guy that I think most re mainstream wrestling fans at that time had sort of written off like, okay, he's had a great career, but it's time to, and boy, did he deliver the goods, not only in the ring and his performances and his matches, but in the dressing room, you know, uh, just sh sloughing off that knowledge and that experience to the rest of us. Uh, just an amazing, amazing talent.